Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here today. Um, thanks, Jessica and, uh, and Karine for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to present my project. Um, so, uh, you know, as I looked at, at our project, I uh, was preparing for this presentation. Um, I realized that um, you know, our, our project is about adding dwelling units to, to suburban neighborhoods. Um, <clears throat> It turns out that um, we, I, I've been putting, I've been like adding uh, dwelling units to to suburban neighborhoods for quite a while, long time now, um, and so I wanted to uh, present um, a few of those projects um, as kind of groundwork for you know, prior to getting into the our, our pomegranate project. Um, uh, starting with this one here, which uh, was is my my first project actually. Um, this this happened. This, this we did this twenty years ago. Um, you know, like at the time, um, you know, like uh, I had colleagues who were doing what we would call urban pioneering. They're thinking about moving back to the downtown. Uh, they're, they're considering, you know, moving into lofts that, that Tom Gilmore were, was converting in bank buildings in downtown. Um, I, I was thinking about doing a different kind of pioneering, but, but out in the suburbs. Um, when, when my parents invited me to come, come home, this is their house. Uh, and build a little house for myself. Um, so, so I did that. Um, so that's that's that is here is this little structure behind you know this, this suburban house. Um, uh, you know, it, it's not it was it's not really a separate unit. Um, it's not really a accessory either. It was actually just an expansion of of an existing building, a uh, single family house. Um, you know, like it's actually permitted as an expansion. Um, but you know, we we designed it and and built it. You know, like like it's a separate unit, and uh, you know, easily convertible. Uh, you know, we closed out the, the opening between the two two buildings, and uh, I was able to kind of live here for a little bit. Um, and um, you know, like uh, I mean, doing this project, it kind of opened my my perspective on on how to actually add units to the like to single families. Um, it you know it. it it didn't ostensibly need to be rezoned that way. Um, it, it was it made, it made clear for me that like I was able to kind of do this kind of thing, um, even though even though it wasn't really allowed. Um, and then moving on, like we you know we started doing other projects kind of like this, um, but like looking at other soft parts of the code um, that kind of allowed this type of thing. Um, like on some of the other projects that I would have, like um, the, there, there would always be this problem that would come up where. Uh, the client will ask, it, well, you know, like I'm probably gonna have to you know, find another place to live while we're doing the construction of the main project. And so then the conversation would always end up where, well, you know, we can probably, you know, build something temporarily in the back uh, that, that, could, that could accommodate temporary quarters um, during construction. And so then like we would do what we would call like recreation rooms, right? That would actually have like, um, like uh, they would actually have like a half bath, um, like over a garage, which is what this is. This one's actually in Venice. Um, that was like the phase one of a, like a smaller phase one of a, of a larger project. Um, and, um, you know, like with a record, it was easily converted like to, to a to actual living unit um, for, for the client to live in, um, like over the garage uh, while they build a front unit. And so then again, like you know, we we kept finding these things, uh, these these opportunities to kind of add, like uh, add dwelling units uh, without it essentially being a, a dwelling unit. Um, we continued to do this like with other projects, like uh, this one. Um, you know, we we figured out that like uh, with if you actually have a pool, um, there you're allowed to actually have a, um, you're actually allowed to have a a full bath um, as long as that full bath is actually not, uh, not connected to your rec room or the garage. Um, you know, of course, you know, like we, it's easy to open a door between the the the, the full bath and the uh, and then the rec room. Uh, in fact, uh, there are other little things that we did where, like, we actually built this so that you know it was right up to the 18 feet, like one story uh, height limit, so that we can squeeze like a little, um, we can squeeze like a little sleeping loft in here, and then and then voila, like again, the the client had a place to live while you know during the year long construction of the front of the front house. Um, and then when they were done, like, you know, this thing basically functioned like a second unit on site, you know, whether it's for, uh, for family, 
you know, they, they're visiting or friends uh, or a guest house. Um, or, you know, the, you know, later on they became landlords and they rented it out. Um, you know, this started to get a little more sophisticated as we kind of got into the bigger projects. Um, and so like, this is another one, this is actually part of a spec house, uh, a much bigger spec house. You can see the big, the, you know, the, the larger, you know, like a like building in the front, but, but the, um, uh, the, this this house back here is actually an accessory building, um, more of the garage. Um, but on here, like uh, you know, in, in the code, what they allowed is that um, you know, if your property is actually over ten thousand square feet, um, you you can actually build a full on guest house where there weren't very many many limits other than that it's not bigger than the front house, um, and that um, and you can have as many bedrooms and bathrooms as you want, but as long as you don't have a kitchen in it. Um, so. You know, so again, like we we build, we design and build these type of things, and like um, they inevitably become like another sort of dwelling unit on site. Um, same thing here on this one. Um, this this is kind of later in in, in the decade, uh, around two thousand eight, and uh, on this one uh, we started to push up right up against the the you know the, the kind of the catastrophe that was the the recession, and uh, this uh, this little accessory building. Uh, this little guest house actually became kind of a lifeboat at some point for, for the client because um, you know the, we actually never finished the front the front part of the building because um, the, the economy crashed. Um, you know, good good thing they had this that they actually built this first because um, it was something that that were you know he, he could kind of like live here and like and ride ride out through the economic turmoil. Um, and so then you know as as the kind of decade wore on, like um, I I started to you know, get into a different kind of experiment with, with this type of project where, you know, instead of just, you know, finding um, like opportunities in single family, um, I was looking for um, like multifamily zone lots that actually weren't fully improved or didn't, didn't ha had not maxed out its, uh, its full density yet. Um, and I kind of invested in like a little triplex um, in the mid city, mid city area. Um, this little triplex uh, was kind of laid out in kind of this way, where um, the there are little there are little six hundred square foot one bedroom bungalows that were sort of staggered apart. Um, and for me, this is perfect for me. Like you know, I, I, at the time, like I was kind of a young professional, um, and uh, I was able to you know, for me, I thought that hey, that's great. Like I could really split up the um, the development of each of these units, you know, and like um, and maybe even add units. Um, I have a detached garage where I could run my office. Um, and so I can kind of do this with limited capital, like in phases, you know, like, and um, I could live in one, you know, rent one out and then uh, like improve the other. So then I, I did the first one in 2007. Um, you know, we tried some things uh, like, you know, putting the living space on the second floor uh, and putting the bedrooms on the first floor, you know, doing roof decks and um, like, you know, like kind of, like subdividing this up, like uh, almost like a bunch of row houses, right? Um, and then, of course, like right around this time, like same thing, the the you know the the, re the great recession came along, and um, and uh, you know what happened was that like you know I did kind of the same thing is that like I I, I you know like I did a little bit of musical chairs where I, I downsized into the front unit, you know, kept renting out the back, and then I was able to kind of ride out the uh, um, the you know the uh, the, the kind of bad economy, um, you know, as, as 2011 came around, like I, you know, I recovered enough to where, you know, I, I started, you know, I started the middle unit and kind of like took it down and rebuilt it, um, you know, like again with the roof deck, um, trying to kind of reproduce uh, some of the, the, you know, the, the sort of desirable benefits of like a single family type of situation. But this is more, again, more like a row house type thing, right? Um, um, I, you know, what happened with this type of uh, development is that like uh, the, the, the sort of driveway becomes kind of this interesting common space um, it's as an extension of the, um, of the, you know, the street, you know, like, um, you know, this becomes this like, kind of primary kind of like, uh, like, like, like hub for both activity and access um, and kind of vehicle traffic. And so this is kind of a picture of what's, you know, you know, of the kind of finished form and you can kind of see what's going on here. Like, you know, I have like a little porch kind of like, you know, like a like entryway here that actually fronts on this, uh, this little driveway. Um, 
the driveway actually ended up kind of like the most interesting and activated space. Um, you know, and finish like you know, we, we could actually have small kind of get togethers and events here. Um, this is actually my office in the back. Um, you know, like my kids could play here. Um, it, it was like, you know, like there would, it would always be kind of like a place where like there would be like a lot of spontaneous interaction with the neighbors and like, um, you know, like delivery and, you know, people just coming in and out. And I, and I found this to be, you know, kind of like a, a great inadvertent like benefit of actually, you know, like laying out a project like this or, or designing a project like this and like creating kind of like a, a kind of micro community. Um, so then, you know, during this time, like, you know, I, I was doing other projects, uh, like kind of larger single family projects, right? And um, the, um, you know, inevitably the, the, um, the you know, the, during this time, like between like around 2008 to 2012, um, the, this issue of scale and, um, you know, like oversized buildings, um, in, in suburbia, like it came to the fore, um, you know, like a, a lot of these improvements, these large buildings that are being built by developers uh, weren't, you know, readily welcomed in the neighborhood. Um, and it started to kind of influence or at least impact our work. Uh, and in fact, the city of LA actually passed like, like a, a mansionization ordinance to try to, you know, kind of mitigate some of this stuff back. Um, and like in the context of me doing these sort of density projects, um, you know, we, I, I wasn't like, you know, I, I didn't see the difference between the, the, the sort of like discourse that was going on about McMansions versus like what I was doing with like, you know, like, like, uh, like what I was doing with like dwelling units in, in suburbia. And so I, I saw a parallel between the, the conversations that were going on um, about, you know, oversized or, you know, like, like large scale uh, single families versus like doing multiple units in single family lots. Um, this is actually a picture of um, so there's some there's somebody that's kind of mean spirited in my neighborhood of Culver City, um, who's actually uh, running around like you know spray painting this in front of like uh, like large houses that are under construction to kind of voice their opposition. <laughs> um, and so I you know while that's sort of mean like uh, it does sort of reflect the kind of sentiment that's going on like in in single families, uh, in single family neighborhoods. Um, so by around 2015, like, uh, like, you know, as much as I wanted to finish, like my other project, um, the little triplex, um, you know, there was an opportunity kind of like presented itself for me to, um, to do another project in Culver City, um, and this time a, a ground, a ground up project. And, um, and so we, we got a, a property over here in Culver City and we, you know, we kind of took it down and, um, and uh, I did like a full-on project, uh, you know, this time ground up. Uh, we basically like, you know, cleared the lot and started over. So it was kind of an excellent opportunity to kind of like apply some of the, uh, these ideas and lessons that I learned in the previous projects um, and, and, and see, you know, how this would work. So it was just, um, so what we did was, you know, this, this is also like a, a duplex um, and, um, you know, it's a, basically this stack, you know, like one unit uh, on the second floor and one unit on the first floor. Um, and we tried to kind of split up some of the amenities of, of the lot, you know, like with, with open spaces on the second, you know, the deck and then the front yard kind of gets dedicated to the front unit. Um, and then, you know, my, my favorite, the, the accessory building, which, uh, which is the garage in the back. Um, in Culver City, um, again, this is, this also predates ADUs. Um, they, they actually allow a, a three quarter bath, like in, um, in the, like in the garage or in the accessory building. And so for me, that just screams dwelling unit. Um, you know, that like, you know, you know, I, I don't see it any other way. And so then when I, so then, you know, I, I kind of phased this out where I basically built this, this little garage and rec room and a, and a full, basically a full bath. Um, and I moved into it um, along with my office. Um, you can see my, my whole family's living in here at this point. And so I, I lived here while I built the front unit. Um, the, the same way that my, you know, my clients were doing like in the previous projects, um, I kind of pulled the same tactic. Um, and so I can be on site and actually build it. This is actually my, that's, you know, later on I converted into my office. Um, that's actually where I sit now. Um, and, and with this one, um, you know, I, again, I, I was aware, I was well aware of the issues that are going on. And, you know, this, this is, 
though this is a zone for multifamily, um, it's it's still mostly uh, uh, it's mostly improved as a single family and not multifamily. Um, but like I I was I kind of understood that like um, even if I was doing something larger in scale, that like there are certain there are certain qualities of of, of suburbia or uh, of suburban development patterns that needed to be kind of maintained. Um, and, and, and for me, that's, that was sort of the, the, the transitional engagement with like, with the right of way, with the, with the street and the rest of the neighborhood. Um, and in that sense, like, you know, I, I, I was, I would always sort of like double down on stuff like, you know, like, like a, like a cover porch, you know, like a landscaped, like front yard and the fence and, and this, um, and I thought that this, uh, this would function in a way where like, uh, you know, it, it's not that far off from, um, from like a single family dwelling um, or a larger single family dwelling. Um, and that uh, like, you know, this would kind of maintain this connection with the, with the neighborhood. Um, this, is, uh, this is the back part of the house with the, uh, with the, uh, the deck. Um, and, you know, like uh, the entry to this one is actually in the back and also with kind of a porch, you know, an entry here, like these small micro courtyards. Um, however, you know, like uh, I, I would have conversations with my, with my neighbors about you know like when now when these projects go up and like I would still get sort of like like the opposition or or comments that like hey it's too too big and that like um you know that that, that you're still sort of like imposing upon like your neighbor um and so I mean I like uh, I mean I as I have those conversations you know like I'm kind of aware of them like you know this is actually why why I painted it blue is because like I kind of wanted it to blend into the sky and like you know they wouldn't the to kind of like address that issue that way. Um, and, you know, that's, that's why we call it a blueplex. Um, and so that brings us like to the present, which is, you know, like I had the opportunity then to, to purchase and, and develop uh, the, the property two doors down for me. Um, so at this point, it's probably good to kind of talk a little bit about like kind of the difference and the kind of impact that land cost has on this, right? So when, when we got bootplex, um, I think we we got the property for about eight hundred thousand um, dollars, but but you know, but like two short years later, when we when we got this property here, the the property was then selling for one point two million. So that was like a, about a fifty percent increase in cost. Um, so as you can imagine, that that's a rather large impact on the construction budget. Um, so immediately it was, you know, like I you know I kind of had limited a much more you know limited means in terms of like of doing what I wanted to do here. Um, so immediately that meant that like, you know, most of the money would go to a, a new second unit. Um, and then I would have to try to find rehabbing the existing um, uh, improvements that are on site. So uh, here there's a single family um, that was rather old and it was like a 1930s era, like, uh, like bungalow. Um, and then like a detached garage and uh, the previous owner actually added like a little rec room back here. Um, unfortunately, this is actually like built pretty, uh, sited pretty far back on the property. Um, so that, you know, in, in most cases, a lot of times this, you know, this type of thing is actually sitting in the middle of the property, which is not great because it doesn't, you can't get maximum use of the open space. Um, so this is kind of the plan. You can see how, like, you know, this is the existing garage and uh, this is the rec room that I, I actually converted into an ADU, um, you know, it's, again, all, all it takes is, is a little kitchenette and a, um, and a full bathroom. Um, and then uh, this, this is the, this is where the, uh, this, this two story building would go. Um, and what I did was I basically slotted it back to actually create a little courtyard here for, for this unit, um, you know, tight footprint and you go two stories, right? So I can get a full, um, like a full program in there. For a unit, right, and then this is all basically existing footprint, uh, the existing building, right, uh, the existing uh, single family, and I kind of rearranged and reorganized this into kind of a three bedroom program. Um, these aren't very big. Uh, this this front unit is about thirteen hundred square feet, um, and then the the back unit is about eleven hundred square feet, uh, two bedrooms, uh, one bathroom. Um, let's see here. So yeah, when I took this thing down, you can see like, only in California do you like take the stucco off and find like, you know, like siding. Uh, it's kind of silly that 
you know, but I mean, as much as I try to save this whole thing, I mean, ultimately at the end of the day, like that's, it's, it's a hundred years old. And so we ended up like having to replace the whole thing. Um, and, uh, and this, this is the finished picture of the front. Um, uh, one of the things that I was trying to do on this one was, um, you know, this, this is kind of a contrast and detailing, right, in the same project, right? This is clearly almost like a different, pro uh, uh, two different buildings, right? Um, I, I, try, I try to do this uh, because, like, it actually creates a, a more sort of natural, granular project um, instead of trying to hide it, like, into one one type of building, right? Like, um, I thought it would be, it was actually important to actually make the two buildings actually distinct, right? Um, you know, for as an architect, it's actually also interesting to try to like do different details in the same pro in the same project. Um, we also try to couch a lot of the pro a lot of the detailing in my office like uh, within sort of conventional detailing, right? And um, materials and methods, right? And so like and besides saving costs, it's like uh, it's a lot faster in terms of construction. Um, like you know, like all the windows are pretty standard. Um, you know, like like uh, standard sizes and so on. Um, and then we basically repeat them like all over the you know, in different places, right? Um, you know, they're, they're actually sized based on the limits of the manufacturer, right? Um, and our, what we need for like, egress. Um, and then the money that we saved, um, like on doing stuff like that, um, I actually put back in like with other uh, more sort of like, like challenging, expensive, like uh, custom details. Um, actually, this is a bathroom where we actually don't have any windows, we actually have a skylight. Um, uh, like the more like uh, we actually would have like a roof like a roof drain so that I can actually avoid putting in like any downspouts on the exterior of the building right and also so that I can actually do siding because um, the siding can tend to be a little more expensive. Um, this is actually a custom downspout like a, a, like a custom sheet metal downspout uh, like a scupper head like at the intersection. Um, we also do like kind of like a zero edge. Kind of razor edge like a coping so that like in order to get like a cleaner um uh, top of the building um this is the courtyard that's in the uh between the two buildings um which is probably one of the better spaces in that in the building um you know this opens out on here it's, it's basically an exterior room that's an extension of this of this of the living space here um, you know, you don't get access from the front unit to here. It's actually kind of cordoned off, right? But you do get a little bit of light and ventilation through here because of this opening for, for the front unit from these awnings. Um, so the front of the house. Um, so I'm going to move to the little walk through here. For a minute here. There you go. Stick the video over. Green, is that looking okay? It looks great. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, so we, we have a drone, so we flew it around a little bit in the neighborhood to um, to kind of show you some of the context. Now, you know, this Culver City, as you can see, it's again, it's very suburban, right? <laughs> Even though it's like in the middle of the city, right? You can see downtown LA out there in the distance. Um, that's that's a Hayden track with uh, um, like a, a lot of the, the Eric Moss projects. Um, and then you'll be able to see here coming around, um, that that's the expo line. Um, that's actually right down the street from me. Um, and you can see, uh, that's the Ivy station over there. They've been building for like the last couple of years. Um, so again, this, this neighborhood originally was, uh, was zoned, uh, medium density, uh, uh medium density zoning, uh, multifamily. Um, but then like, I think 15 years ago, they actually downzoned it to, to two family dwelling. Um, and then like a few years later, they, they further downzoned it to single family. Um, and so I, I happen to be in the stretch that is uh, still zoned R2, two family. Um, so you can see there's some, you know, you know there's, still so, there's still quite a few like single family dwellings like in the neighborhood, even though it's zoned that way. Um, so you can see that that's that's the other my other project the blue flex and then this is um, this is the this is the pomegranate um,
Bill, can you remind us what year you moved to this neighborhood? Uh, so I, you know, I, I moved here for, for Ruplex in 2015. Um, and then um, I, I did pomegranate in 2017. Um, so this, that's Sam, Angeli, and their dog, George. Uh, they live in the front unit. Um, I think they recently got married and, um, and started a family here. Um, so this is a front yard. Um, you come in, it's landscape, you know, it's got a fence. Um, you know, it's got the porch. Um, you know, from, from, from this point out, I mean, like, um, you, you can't really tell this is a multifamily dwelling. Um, in fact, many of my neighbors had no idea that this was going on until like way later. Um, in comparison to the blueplex, like it was much less traumatic. I mean, like, um, like when I, when blueplex was going up, um, I, I got a lot of neighbors coming over and asking me questions. <laughs> um, but on this one, like, like most people had no idea what was going on. Um, because, you know, even though there was a construction project going on, they, they didn't, they didn't, it was much less suspicious. It was like, it actually triggered a, a lot less paranoia than, than my, than the other project. Um, Again, that that scale of the pro the scale of the project actually has you know kind of like kind of a very indelible impact like on on the rest of the neighborhood. Um, So I mean, these spaces are, you know, pretty conventional. I mean, like, uh, you know, it's it's got a bit of an open um, open space plan, like for the living spaces, right? Um, the, the the bedrooms are separate separated, like um, they're not kind of clustered in one area. Um, you know, so so in, in that way, this this house is is kind of updated to sort of contemporary expectations. Um, you, know, you can kind of see the. As we're going through this video, can you talk a little bit about certain features um, in these separate homes that you try to, you know, give a little attention to? Um, I think that um, you know, primarily it was you know, some of those other issues that I talked about. I mean, the interiors were, you know, we kept it pretty minimal. Um, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but like I, like for a lot of this type of stuff, I mean, like, uh, like especially for a bungalow, like, you know, I, I kind of have this obsession about the eaves, right? So we spent most of our time kind of like figuring out how to make these eaves, the eaves on this building, even though we can't see them here. Um, you'll be able to see it later on in the video as we walk down the driveway. Um, so from my recollection that that's actually primarily the thing for the for this front unit that that we focused on was like the the way that the roof eaves and how I kind of like integrated with the front porch um that's that's mostly me being an architect trying to be true to you know to, to this this type of architecture um the other part was I was trying to make sure that the windows actually kind of like like, like really kind of took advantage of the fact that like, you know, it, it mostly has its perimeter. I mean, as a multifamily dwelling, like, um, you know, there, there isn't like a large sort of interface between the two units, right? And, that, and that's that's deliberate, right? I, I kind of wanted to have maximum perimeter. Um, so again, you know, for, for windows and like lots of light and ventilation. Um, but, but otherwise, I mean, like this, this is a pretty garden variety, like, you know, bungalow, you know, bungalow building, bungalow house. And so, 
but yeah, like here, like you can see, you know, like we, we, like that's, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to, you know, make sure that, you know, the, these eaves are really kind of like, were really kind of like, like crafted properly, right? Um, the casing and the room around the windows. Um, yeah, even though, like on this one, like, uh, you know, the gutters and the downspouts, um, the siding, right? Um, I mean, because it is an investment property, there's just certain things that you want to make sure that you're not going to have to replace that often or fix. Um, right. That's why I ended up using this is all like fiber cement board, right? Like, um, not not only the, the maintenance part, but like, well, I've actually listened to the maintenance part because, like, you know, it doesn't rot or, you know, like, yeah, like, um, you know, I was going to go into that a little bit later in terms of the investment part of it, too. Like, um, you know, like I'm, I'm not just turn, I'm not just trying to turn this around and sell it for a profit. Like I kind of like have a much longer horizon on this. That's a uh, that's Sasha. He he actually lives in the ADU in the back, um, next to the garage. Um, and this is what the the little ADU looks like. It's a single room studio. Um, there's there's no detailing here is existing. <laughs> Um, although I will say this, this goes back to my roots. Um, like the first project that I did, which was the one that I presented earlier, like, uh, in, in San Gabriel. Um, yeah, I mean, like it basically it was, you, you could call it a, uh, almost like a, a shell and core type project where there's really not many, very much interiors. Right. And, you know, I, I did kind of a ghetto kitchen back then. And I, I did the same thing here. You know, it's basically like three appliances and, uh, you know, a stainless steel, like counter sink that you know you got you get from a kitchen store, um, which is perfectly functional. Um, and so I mean Sasha and and, and the occupants of, of the pomegranate like kind of share that, that kind of middle area. Um, like Sam and Angela actually park like in the garage in the back. Um, and so again like I. I try to duplicate that kind of communal common space that I had over at Orange Grove and that little triplex that I did. Um, so that those points of, of interaction, this that sort of spontaneous like engagements, like it's still there, like in this type of like, in this kind of development. Uh, that's the Bruno, Natalie. And their two kids, Diego and Martin, Martin. Um, so in this one, <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, besides the fact that it's two stories, I mean, like, um, I, you know, it's, you try to create, create equivalence between the, the units, right? But just like, you know, different types of, uh, of benefits, right? So, so here, like, you know, there's, uh, the ceilings are a little taller, so like you know, it's nine feet tall. Um, so you get a little more volume, but you get a little less square footage, right? Um, you know, they, they don't have a third bedroom, right? They don't have a second bathroom, right? And so, like for me, it's like it's about tr like a bit, a kind of a trade off, like you know, there's a game between myself where I'm actually trying to like you know, the, the two units are not exactly the same, obviously, but then like there are equivalencies like between the two. Um, you can see the kitchen's almost back to the same kind of kitchen, right? But then the rest of the spaces are just different. So, you know, like I, I think of that that outdoor, um, that that little courtyard, that private courtyard out there as kind of the third room. Um, it's obviously not a bedroom per se, right? But 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 it is like you know like like an integral like a extension of the exist existing house. Um,
so I just wanted to remind everyone that we would love to have a, you know, a, a lengthy Q&A uh, for this case study to ask Bill as you know, many questions as you want. I'll get it started um, after this, but please um, you know, start gathering those questions in your head now. You can put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Um, uh, but just to put them in the chat and then I will uh, announce you and you can unmute yourself. I think besides having their, letting their kids play out here um, and just having their own private kind of courtyard space like this, like, um, I, I, like I think that it's just like nice to have like a place like this for their, just just to get outside of the house, um, especially during the last year. Um, I, I actually interviewed um, Bruno and Adelaide about like for for this for this presentation, I, I don't, I don't think we have time to put the interview, but like, um, it's interesting to get their take on like how lucky they felt that they, they actually had the space. Um, just for pure sanity. This video, since it's just nice and peaceful, is kind of reminding me of our tours where it's our live tours where they're actually like nice and quiet and people are just walking through and taking their time. So thank you for taking the time for making this video. It's actually good for me to actually walk through the spaces like this too. I mean, like, um, I very seldom get the opportunity to do, I guess, what we would call like post occupancy sort of surveys of spaces, right? And so the other unique thing about these projects that I've done is that, like, well, one is like, I, I got to I get to live in a bunch of the other ones. Um, but this one, this is the first one we, I did that I did not, you know, I did not occupy. Um, so it was, it's good to be able to see. Um, and, and talk to uh, to Bruno and, uh, and Natalie about like what it's like to live here, uh, and to be able to kind of walk through like this and actually do this um, do this video. Um, so, so for, for this project, um, there's a couple of things. Um, I, it was really important for, um, for me that, you know, that the, the multifamily part of it was sort of obvious, you know, that you could see you know, that, oh, hey, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that it was obvious that like, yeah, there's there's another unit in the back and that like, it wasn't just a big building. Um, it kind of goes back to this discussion about like nationalization and big houses. Um, and so for this one, I, I, I think, I thought it was important. I mean, that's why we deliberately did it this way. And so that like, you know, that there was like, a, it was clear that there's two buildings on site and there's two units and there's two families. Um, 
Yeah, that, that, that was important because like, I wanted to show that, hey, like, you know, d density isn't so bad that like you can add units to a single family a neighborhood. And in fact, it's good that it, you know, it actually is an improvement, you know, as an alternative to say to the to a McMansion, right? And so that like the scale, there, there's a nice trade-off for the scale that you get, not only do you get more units um, and more families in the neighborhood, uh, and, um, but like, in fact, it's actually, you know, like it's a desirable and livable place. And so that, that's, that was my point that I was trying to make with my project. Um, and it was also kind of touches on why I, I kind of like, I have this thing about like trying to rebrand like density because it's got all this baggage that, that's associated with it. You know, like I do projects that I end up having to engage with neighborhoods um, for my project, you know, with uh, neighborhood councils and like public, you know, like uh, pub hearings and so on with the planning department. And yeah, like I, I hear the, the constituents and stakeholders and, and, and uh, neighbors and, you know, and, their, and they voice their concerns. And while some of that can deviate into, you know, irrational, um, like, you know, like, like fear and paranoia, like, I feel like this can actually be a solution to some of, some of these issues, you know, not, not just to address like a, a housing shortage, but then also to, um, you know, to, you know, as a, as a path forward to, to address some of those issues of like, how, how do we transform like suburbia as we move forward? And I, you know, I do these projects because I, you know, I experiment with this type of project because I, I want to know, like, I want to find out if that's, if that's, if that's viable. Um, and so that's why, you know, I, I, I did that on purpose. I mean, yeah, I mean, like I, I could have easily uh, just built the building that just looked like a big building, uh, but I didn't do that. I, I deliberately made the back part, you know, like, like blaringly, you know, I, it, it, I picked red for a reason. I <laughs> said so that like, it's, it's kind of a giant, like, hey, like there, there's, there's a unit back there. Uh, the other thing that I do is I, I pick these cheeky names for these projects because I'm kind of poking fun a little bit at, at some, I'm not poking fun, but I'm trying to like disassociate with some of that stigma. Of, of density and in, 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 in suburban neighborhoods, like you know, I, again, same thing. I I, I kind of want to show that like hey, it's not it's not really that bad. It's actually really good. Like, it's it's a good it's a good alternative to to what what else is going on because like you know like like in most other neighborhoods like this one like you know a lot of like there are other properties older properties that are you know being being transferred over to to developers right and they're that, they're not doing this right they're they're doing the other thing. Um, there, there's actually other projects up and down the street that are like, you know, in fact, somebody did do a multifamily project instead of a single family. Um, and, but, you know, like they, I don't know if they, you know, like I'm glad it was, if they have multiple units, but then I don't, I don't know if they kind of like they have the same sort of light touch or, or, you know, thoughtfulness about like, you know, what, you know, what their project would, would do or actually, you know, engage with the neighborhood, right? Um, and so, Again, like, you know, like, like, you know, I'm trying to kind of make a point that like, hey, like, you know, that there's a way of doing this um, and, and create units while, while I'm still addressing those issues. So thank you for, uh, for letting me present this. Thank you, Bill. Um, we already have a lot of questions, which we'll, we'll get to. I love all the projects. And one thing I wanted to say about your house, even though maybe it could be categorized as a McMansion, is that it's um, because it is large home but your office is with within there and it's like you saw the future coming um that you know uh, but i think that you're doing a, an amazing job for this neighborhood i'd like to know um you know what you're working on now and um and if you've inspired anybody else to create um more projects like this um i'll take that last part first um okay yeah, I, I think I literally inspired a, a a developer down the street to copy my my blueplex. Um, except he didn't quite do it correctly um, because they didn't hire an architect; it was a general contractor. Um, they certainly weren't able to kind of duplicate some of the detailing that I had on my on the building uh, on the bufax um, and so they kind of like did a close proximity right but then they also kind of like fell back on your typical 
sort of like developer type tactics, which is like, you know, maximum floor area, you know, not a lot of open space, um, just meeting, uh, you know, like, like code standards and so on and so forth, just to get, just to get as big, as massive a building as possible to, for profit, right? Um, and so in a way, I mean, he, I, I met the guy, he came over to my house as he was trying to figure out how to copy my building um, while he was developing his, his building, right? Um, and we talked a little bit. Um, and then of course, like a year later, like he, his building went up um, and then he was trying to sell it. And yeah, like he, he actually, he recently sold it for $3 million, which I guess is good, right? <laughs> but, wow. but that's, you know, I you can't, it's unintended constant, you know, like, I guess it's best that it's actually two units and not um, not one big building, uh, which like, there's a lot of that going on too. Like people are building really big houses like like in this neighborhood too, as well as in many other Los Angeles neighborhoods. Um, so that's, you know, like uh, I, what I do is sort of very light scale, right? Um, and if I, it's like, I, I work for a lot of developers. And so like the conversation is always going to be, um, hey, like, how do we maximize profit? Um, that's just the reality of it. Um, and, and, you know, we try to have, you know, a, you know, a conversation where we, we try to find like a middle ground where we, you know, we can get both, right? And so, like, I, I don't know, like, you know, what I've done. I mean, it, it, it could potentially, I mean, I have, I have other clients who are actually interested in doing this type of thing on, on an even lighter scale than this. Um, and so, you know, and yeah, like they're interested in putting in ADUs and so on and so forth too, and then become and becoming their own landlords um, and living there, you know, like, you know, simultaneous occupancy. So, so that's actually encouraging. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, you know, I, I, you know, like I would love to do another one of these and just keep going, right? But, you know, like, as I, as I was saying earlier, like, you know, like now, now it costs like a million and a half dollars to buy land here in the same neighborhood, right? Like that's essentially double what I paid for 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 uh, for Bluplex, and so I don't know if that's viable anymore. Um, but uh, but yeah, I've, I've actually started moving on to to bigger projects. Like you know, I actually have like some TOC projects in the office now, uh, with like you know, ten, like seven to to you know thirty units. Um, the, the thing with the units is that like it's it's kind of it should be obvious, but like you know, the more units you build, as as like as property rates, you know, property value goes up. Like the only way to offset costs is to build more units. Right. That's, that's what I'm saying that like, you know, density is actually more of a solution than, a, you know, and like as, and, and in terms of the sort of mansionization conversation, uh, again, like I've had conversations with neighbors about like, you know, they, the, 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 snap reject, the, the snap reaction is like, oh my God, that's such a big house. Like who, who needs to live in that such a big house, right? Um, sometimes they would say that about my house. And so then like, I would tell, well, but does it matter if like, you know, there's like, you know, two units in it, there's three units in it, right? Um, and actually it does like, you know, actually it makes a difference that that is a viable retort to, Hey, that's too big. Like, okay. But, but it supports three families. Does that, you know, does that make it better? And in some cases it does. So. Um, I definitely agree that it, I think it makes it better. Um, but let's get on to everyone else's questions. Um, Ellen, um, I don't see that your camera's on, so I can't spotlight you, but if you want to unmute yourself, um, and ask your question, otherwise I can say it for you. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, hey, Bill. Hi. Awesome presentation. Um, I just, I, my question was about uh, timing, uh, you know, like if you could talk about how long it took from like the design through the end to the project. Um, yeah, I would love to talk about that. Um, that's part of the strategy that I use. Um, like speed is of the utmost importance, like in these type of projects. Um, and so one of the reasons why I love these is that like, um, it's, uh, there's still like, you know, in terms of, I can geek out a little bit here, like uh, in terms of like building code, like these are all still like R3 occupancy. Like, so the single family R3 occupancy actually covers like duplexes. Um, and the important thing about that is, is two things. Um, it saves costs and speed. Like, you know, it's like a cost part because like, you know, like, because I, I do these, I'm not a contractor. And so they, if I need to pull a permit, like, um, like I, I can still pull it as an owner builder because it's not, like for example, R1 occupancy, like on, on the triplex one, like that was actually a three unit property. And so unfortunately, like I would have to kind of like get a general contractor to come pull permits for me, right? Um, so so that, that's kind of actually important, right? Uh, the other thing is that like, the reason why like, you know, I, I were able to, so like for, 
uh, for, for pomegranate, like it, the total time that took um, from property purchase, um, design permit to sort of occupancy, it was about 12 months, right? That's actually really fast um, for a project like that. Um, part of that is because I kind of cut all the, you know, all the kind of middle uh, type sort of development steps, right? I mean, this is quintessentially like, you know, um, like design build uh, delivery that, that most of us kind of know, right? Except that I cut the other part, which is that, like, you know, now it's like developed design build because I own it, right? I own it, I designed it, and then I built it, right? Um, and I can really kind of only do that at the scale, right? Which is fine, you know, like I can still add units, right? Um, but like uh, it was the same with uh, Blueplex too, like you know, like um, it was a little more than a year because like, I built, uh, I built the, the garage like in about four months, right? Um, and then I built like uh, the main house like in about nine months, right? Um, the, the speed is important because like, you know, as any developer tell you, like, you know, time is like, you know, it's carrying costs and all that other stuff and you're not occupying it or it's not generating income. Like, uh, like, you know, it's not rented out. Like, it's just like, you know, it kind of sucks into the resources, right? Um, as an architect, like I, I look at that, I mean, it sounds like we don't <laughs> like, you know, that, like, but like, you know, for me, like, it's like, I feel like the faster that we can go, the, the more money that we can save, the more, not the money that, hey, like, I, I get more profit. For me, it's like, like now I have more opportunity to, to do cool stuff. Like, like some of the things that like, that, that I have in the building that I would normally not be able to pull off in other projects is because like, I kind of like, um, I kind of manipulate the budget so that I can like pull those things off, right? You know, I kind of have them earmarked during design, right? And I figure out other things, uh, sort of these pathways around like budget constraints to try to like pull this stuff off, right? Whether it's a siding or the coping or, you know, whatever, or if I happen to want like a big, you know, crazy steel trellis, like whatever it is, is that like, you know, I'll, I'll kind of earmark that, right? And figure out how to do it. Like, like um, so the, the construction, but the construction schedule is part of that. Like, you know, like if it takes me 12 months instead of eight months to do it, right? Like there is this, there's a chunk of money there that I can't use for, for, for architectural detailing, right? Because you know, as an architect and being in the role of developer, I get to prioritize that, right? I get to say, yeah, like I want, I want to maximize my my open space. So then I can do, I can go into the budget and make sure that that gets kind of priority versus something else, right? So like, you know, I'm not going to spend, you know, like like a gazillion dollars on appliances, right? I'm just going to get sort of like your your middle of the row appliances, right? But I'm going to get like you know like five percent siding. So I don't know if that answers your question. Oh yes, thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. Um, so Daniel asked a question about costs and square footage. Daniel, do you wanna unmute yourself? Um, he did go over the square footage a little bit. Um, yeah, the, hi, it was a great presentation. Hi. I love the video, <laughs> it's really awesome. And one of the th questions that I mostly encounter nowadays is, is like obviously the first thing they ask is oh how much is going to cost me to do an adu and it just seems to be skyrocketing like month every month over so i would just wonder since these are fairly recent what was your um you know overall development cost for for, for the expansions um yeah of course um so these we're all built for around $200 a square foot. Um, now that's skewed because, you know, I, again, I didn't hire a general contractor, right? I, I ran my own, you know, my, my own build. Um, and so I guess to kind of like equate it to what it should have been is that you, you would slap 20% on top of that, right? You know, because most general contractors you know, put a 20% premium on top because of, you know, overhead, profit, and all that stuff, and insurance, right? Um, so, you know, it, it should have been you know, 240, $250 square foot, right? Um, I'm actually building an ADU now. Um, and yeah, like th things are a lot more expensive. Um, it's, it's, cl it's closing in on $300 square foot, which is just cost. Um, you know, there, there's, there's been a run on lumber recently, yeah. so that's gotten really expensive, right? There's a really, there's high demand. I mean, even though we had COVID last year and things seemed to shut down, um, that's not exactly what happened. Like, I think construction kept going. Yes. Um, and so, you know, like I have this obsession with 
the cost, not because, you know, again, for, for different reasons. And, you know, like, I, I kind of want to figure out how to like, you know, like they kind of like get the stuff, you know, like, like um, on this other talk that I interestingly did, like there was a, this huge emphasis on sustainability, right? And I agree, like, I want to do all that stuff too. I want to put the, the solar and I want to put like the more expensive efficiency systems, uh, efficient systems in the building, right? So that it actually is sustainable, right? That it doesn't contribute to global warming. Right, but a lot of that stuff is invisible, right? And it costs a lot of money. And so like, I'll, I'll often run into like, I'll often run into these trade-offs, right? There's, there's a lot of opportunity costs in like in a construction, in a design and construction budget, right? Like uh, the, the, the best one I had like a few years ago was, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a client who was really, who had the, you know, they, they had the resources, right? But like, you know, he was looking at between like a gray water, like tank system, you know, for capturing uh, water, right? And then like, you know, treating it so that it becomes portable versus like a kick-ass pool, right? And uh, it, it, interestingly, they both came in at the same cost, about a quarter million dollars. Right? And the guy was just kind of like, which one do I want? Do I want the kick-ass pool or do I want like, you know, my, you know, conscious free, like co conscience free, like, um, you know, like, like portable gray water collection system, right? And you can just guess which one he picked because like, you know, like for, for him, you know, for his perceptive perception, like, you know, the, the pool ended up get, getting more value for him, right? Yeah. For, for me, like, I, you know, as, as I kind of like run these buildings, right, I'm trying to figure out a way of actually kind of like, you know, back ending some of this stuff too. Like, so for example, like the, the earlier project that I did 20 years ago, like, you know, like my family still owns it. And so I still manage it, right? Um, and we rented it, we're renting it out now, right? And over time, we built up enough so, sort of like, you know, a capital, right? So now we can, you know, so we've up upgraded systems, right? Now, you know, initially like, you know, like in, in, in 2000, I mean like Title 24 was terrible, right? <laughs> you can physically put whatever you want in the building is like, it doesn't like still complies. Um, but now like, you know, we've, we've, we've since like upgraded the systems, um, even though it's unprompted, right? You know, we just wanted to have, you know, like a better space, you know, like, and like, like, like next year, we're gonna actually put it, finally put in like, like, like uh, solar PVs, right? Mm -hmm. Again, like instead of, pulling profit out of the, the building like you know we're actually putting it back right like uh, again i mean like i'm i'm an outlier obviously like i don't know that many building owners that do this right like you know but for me like you know like because of what i do like um and because of what i you know, what i prioritize like you know i i kind of want to figure out like how to pay for that stuff right whether it's architecture or sustainable features and so on so thank you that's great yeah, so we have two more questions um, I want to make sure that we get to. Um, so uh, Jamila, do you want to um, unmute yourself so you can elaborate on your question a bit? Hi, Bill. Hi, Jams. <laughs> um, no, I was just interested in in how you deal with the sound transfer. Just I know, I know from your Blueplex, you have that outdoor space above the other unit and um, just if you can talk briefly about that, what your strategy or what you're thinking about when you design. Um, right. So when I first started doing um, these these multi units, um, the the partition wall was always a wall, right? And it was always limited or limited, uh, meaning that I would try to limit the the actual point of contact between the two units, right? Like in in the pomegranate, um, you know, there, there's really only a a stretch of wall, a common wall that's only about maybe 12, 15 feet long where, where, uh, where sound could potentially transmit over, right? And, and if you talk to Bruno or, or Sam or Angeli, they would, they would hardly know that there was somebody living next, like directly next door, like essentially in a row house uh, or, or even an apartment type situation, right? So they don't feel like apartments, right? Um, my blueplex is probably the only one where I stacked it. Right. So, so again, like, like I was saying, like, you know, th these are all experiments for me. Like, you know, I, I try, I try, I try out some broad stroke ideas. Right. Um, and so like, so on bootplex, you know, yeah, I, I did a stack. I basically put, you know, the units right on top of each other. And now like the, the, the partitionary envelope is to say is much bigger, right. <laughs> it's over the entire lower unit. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like we uh, we're all, you know, there are a lot of architects on, on here, right? You know, we, we kind of know, we understand the STC type detailing that actually goes into that, right? And so, yeah, I, I just, I find the highest STC I can um, and, and like, you know, I, and I do it that way, you know, like light, lightweight concrete on top and then like resilient channels below, right? Um, 
And even so, like, uh, you know, there's going to be, you know, I have kids, so there's going to be sound transmission, right? But it's just very limited. Um, and like, uh, I mean, I, I, I talk to my, my, my downstairs tenant all the time and like, you know, I, I, I try to find out like, and actually it's, it's, it's very well sort of managed in terms of the sound transmission. Um, so so that, that actually works. Uh, but I, yeah, like ideally I, I would rather do row houses than, than you know, than stack, so. Thank you. Thanks, Jamila. Good question. Um, and so then last we have from Pooja. Um, she's asked a couple questions. Um, we got to one of them. Um, but Pooja, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, hi, Bill. Thanks for this presentation. Hi. Um, what's the maximum size of the ADUs in Color City and how long is the permit process? Um, I think they defaulted to, to state the standard right? So I think it's like 1200 square feet. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd be like, a, you know, the, it's all ministerial, meaning that it's all by right. Um, they don't, you know, they, I think almost all the cities have basically kind of pulled all the stops um, on, on ADUs. Like, uh, it's actually pretty easy to do. I mean, like, you know, they got rid of parking requirements. Um, they, you know, they allow all kinds of grandfather rights, um, like when you convert a garage. Um, I mean, they're, they're even allowing you to go uh, go second story now. I mean, like uh, for a while there, I think they're trying to limit uh, two story ADUs, like uh, depending on which which city you're in. Um, but like, uh, but in Culver City, like they've actually become very. I mean, actually, mo most of the LA Basin, uh, it's actually very easy to to do an ADU, ADU now. Like, um, but yeah, it maxes out at 1,200 square feet. Um, which is pretty good. I mean, like, you know, like the, the pomegranate is like about, it's actually less than 1200 square feet, it's 1100 square feet, right? Um, and is the permit process um, uh, difficult or is it easy? I mean, you know, this, the city of LA has got their standard ADUs that they've gotten, but I'm just wondering I wish what it was easier. I really wish it was easier. Um, you know, I, I do a lot, I do a lot of permitting. I actually have a lot of engagement and interaction with like the, the different cities. Um, and the permitting right and the different agencies that actually have like purview or projects um and i really wish they would really even streamline even more i mean I, it's great that they have standard plans now that, that's great um but i recently discovered that like in san diego county like they actually have standard plans also right but like that thing is amazing like it's like a full-on manual on how to do it right like you know really conventional like, like i earlier i was talking about how, like like you know even though i have the capacity to do like the custom details, right, and, and custom fabrications and all that stuff. Like, I don't do it because you know budget and all that stuff and speed, right? You know, like if it takes eight months to get something done, like that's just like it's gonna really, you know, kind of get into the schedule, all right? But like, what I like to do is like, I try to keep everything kind of conventionally detailed, right? Like easily pull, like easily fabricated or installed, right? You know, and then I, you know, it makes it easier for you to actually find like qualified people to come out and, you know. And, and build it for you too, right? So again, for speed, right? Like, you know, like I have to find like the one or two people that's able to do that particular detail for that project, right? I might have to wait like a long time, right? And it still wasn't really worth it, right? Um, so yeah, like, con like having something like conventional, like, you know, like a standard plan is great, like, cause it makes it a lot easier to do, right? A little less daunting too, right? You know, like, um, you know, I, I've practiced long enough to remember there was a type five sheet, right? <laughs> Um, and I had, I used to tell clients to go, Hey, look, like I'll help you drop a plan and you just take it down there and pull your own permit with a type five sheet. Right. They didn't need one of those for, for ADUs, frankly. So. Thank you. Welcome. Thank, thanks Pooja. Um, we actually have one more question. I think it's a, it's a great question to end on if you still have time oh, um, from Rob. Um, Rob, do you want to unmute yourself? If not, I'll read the question. Hi, can Hi. you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Oh, great. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, making some time for another question. Um, I enjoyed hearing about these projects because, um, you know, you often see these great little gems of projects uh, as you go around uh, the city, the region. Um, so to get some inside information uh, is great. Um, 
I was just curious if you would actually recommend to other architects to take on the challenge of, um, of doing a project like this. Obviously, um, you know, construction costs are way up now. Um, property prices are also up. Um, it's a different animal, um, but there are opportunities in other places. You maybe just have to look a little harder. Um, so would you actually recommend um, taking this on? And if yes, then, uh, you know, can you share some basic, uh, you know, recommendations for what to keep in mind or, or, you know, what's the mantra that you should, you should keep in mind when you're doing something like this? Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, like the first one I did when I was 28, I was straight out of, I, I, came, I was out of school for a year and I just said, screw it. Right. <laughs> I jumped right in. I had no experience. Right. Um, I do the same thing with my colleagues. Like I have friends that are thinking about it. And like, I can't emphasize enough. Um, I can't emphasize enough to do it. But, you know, and, and yeah, like uh, I've, I've even coached um, clients of mine who are not architects, who have nothing to do with the, uh, with the profession, um, to, you know, who have no construction experience, right? You know, they're busy uh, DIYers, right? Uh, weekend warriors. Uh, and yeah, I mean, like I, I had a client a year ago who, who did their own ADU. You know, they just hired a bunch of people. So yeah, it's actually, you know, it's very rewarding. I mean, there's a long history of that for a lot of architects now, like, you know, doing their own building, right? You know, like building their own home, right? You know, just, you just go down the list of all the famous architects in LA, right? They've all done it, right? Um, in fact, uh, there are architects that have done their own, like, you know, their own like multifamily developments, right? Like, um, like uh, you know, like, like Ray Cappy has like a has like a five unit apartment like on National, right? Or like uh, I don't know if Gregory Ain did like the Dunsmuir Flats. Um, that's like a four unit property, right? But I mean, like, there's kind of like you know, like um, with multifamily or this type of multifamily, right? It actually pencils out better. Like, um, if you try to do a, a single family, right? You know, you might build yourself or design yourself out, out from underneath yourself. You know, like. Um, <laughs> You know, you, cause when you're done, you might not be able to afford to live there, right? Uh, one of the reasons why I do multifamily like this is because uh, like, you know, at the end of the day, once I occupy and I actually, you know, become a landlord, like um, it does, you know, it does make it, you know, work out better so that I can live there, uh, right? Like, so that like between my contribution to the, to the care of the property um, and the rent, like I'm able to kind of like, and again, from there, like, you know, cause I know that like, I'm able to kind of like, you know, figure out a budget that, where I can actually build no, stuff. No, no, no. Actually, I have the, the, the day after. Uh, April 5th is my shot. Um, so, so, yeah, like I, I, I encourage it. Like, if anybody wants to take that leap, absolutely. <laughs> you know, like, it's like the most, I, I feel like personally, it's the most rewarding thing possible. Yeah, I can imagine. Great. Thank you, Bill. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for all the great questions. Um, should have started this off, but we found out about Pomegranate because Bill won an RAA award last year. And um, just this project really stood out in my mind. Um, I'm gonna talk about myself for a second, but Bill, I really wanna be able to have a project similar to um, Pomegranate and the home before. I think you're gonna inspire a lot of people to do the same. Um, and we thank you so much